Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial. Go to audibletrial.com slash Rushmore. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Hey, welcome to the Mount Rushmore podcast. My name is Jeff, and as per the usual, I got my home slices, Richard. Hello. And Michael. Howdy. Ricardo and Miguel. They have. Are they a, here too? They're here too. Oh. They have a tete a tete. Hola. Yeah, we're, we're, we're being broadcast on SAP as well. So <laughs> it's just two guys named Ricardo and Miguel who are just repeating what we say in Spanish. These guys, um, they're always kind of up in each other's uh, grills with the beef about the most ubiquitous aspects of any topic. And this time around, they're discussing the Mount Rushmore of Kickstarter fiascos. Ricardo, why did you chose this? Um, well, beyond the fact that it's uh, continuing my my my, re- my never ending theme of frauds, charlatans, yeah, Charles, yes. all that sort of stuff, yes, hucksters, shysters, hucksters, shysters, people who aren't what they say they are. Yeah, um, I I I have never contributed to a Kickstarter crowdfunding sort of thing. Oh, okay. Um, I have. I've have? done a lot. I've been disappointed many times. <laughs> really? Yeah. Because I know other people, and I, there was a story. There are a couple of stories from other people that I had been thinking about. Where they wound up feeling disappointed and feeling like they shouldn't have, they they wish they hadn't contributed to whatever funding thing that they had, whether it was a product and the product didn't come out, or it was not what it was advertised, or something else. Yeah. Um, and so I just started thinking about the fact that God, you know, Kickstarter Kickstarters are such a crapshoot. You're there's no guarantee that any you're 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 throwing money blindly and hoping that something works. Yeah. Which is just amazing to me. Mm. Which is why I've probably never done it. My wife has done it a couple of times. Once was to fund this Australian TV show that we like. Has a they're trying to do a movie of it. Sure. So she, I think she sent them dingoes or something. I don't know what she sent them. That's the that's the currency <laughs> there. Yeah, they, the currency is dingo. Over I believe, down under. I believe it's, it's a stray or, wild dog. Yeah, I got or I boomerangs. Got <laughs> I think it's boomerangs. I think they pay for everything in boomerangs. Oh, I got to check to to see our. Our feed and how many listeners we have down in Australia. I think we oh, just yeah. lost most of them. Yeah. Um, so she's done that. I think she did the Veronica Mars movie one as well. So oh, okay. she's two for two with being happy with what she did yeah. and getting stuff. But I know other people who have not been so happy. So mm-hmm. I just wanted to explore. I thought it was a, a fertile ground for uh, exploration. I love it. I love it. So uh, Richard came up with it. Richard kickstarted this idea. Uh, Richard's topic. Uh, so Michael, you'll start. Rich, I just want to clarify one thing. This could be like. This is like crowdfunding. Right? Oh, sure, not, yeah. It could be like an Indiegogo sort of thing, not just Kickstarter. Oh, oh sure. This is, I mean, Kickstarter is sort of like the, the Kleenex or Xerox yes. or what have you, where it's just, this is what people know about. But it could be any crowdfunding. Cool. Because I'd like to start off with a personal one. Oh. Uh, the Indiegogo campaign that I contributed to oh. uh, and received the product for. So I don't know if it's a failure in that sense, but the LUP, L-U-U-U-P, three U's, litter box. For my fucking cats. Oh, God. Uh, this was a litter box that is like one of those sifting ones where it's like three levels, maybe explaining the three U's, where you, the cat does his business. Yeah. Then you kind of lift the litter up, the two parts of the thing up. And yeah. Get rid of the waste. You turn it around or and put the other part back on top and then so go, many to, steps. Oh go to God. town. Let me tell you something. This thing fucking sucked. Oh, uh, awful! We ended up just throwing it away. Mm-hmm. Let me tell you something else about litter boxes. There is no good way to clean up cat shit. Yeah, it always is terrible. We have gone through box after contraption after. Ro- we had this robotic one, this very expensive robotic one that turns. Oh yeah, I think I saw that one. Yes, yeah. it turns. At, it detects when the cat has left the box after a few moments, and mm-hmm. it just. Sh- you know, sifts the shit yeah. and the piss into the thing, and then you wrap it up. That was always awful and gross and disgusting. Yeah. The litter box, just in general, there is no better one. Yeah. The only thing that you can do is get a better, like, litter. Oh, that, yeah. Like, yeah. is kind of doesn't stick or mm-hmm. whatever. But if anyone is trying to sucker you into a better litter box, it doesn't exist. Any sort of box where they can do their business, it's always going to be yeah. terrible. A box of shit's a box of shit. It, it always kind of smells until you get rid of it. It always kind of tracks throughout the house. It, it is never going to work. And this one that we 
paid way too much money for. I think it was something like it contributed 30 something dollars uh-huh. to these three plastic sifters that <laughs> vaguely fit together. Did they have an option where five dollars just to get your name on the side of the box of poop? <laughs> That's one of the things that I hate. <laughs> a custom one? Yeah. No. No, but um, I think one of the worst things about it, it was such a simple design that was pushed back months and months and months. Yeah. When like the research and development realized like, oh, the plastic that we use sucks. Yeah. And it's not going to be at the price that we thought we could get mm-hmm. it for. Mm-hmm. I don't know. We live in this kind of post Shark Tank Dragon's Den world right. of, you know, I appreciate geniuses and people that come up with practical solutions to things. Yeah. This is a solution that we have been trying to solve since Egypt in the dawn of time. And it's yeah. just like, since we domesticated cats, it's always been like, I don't know. It sucks. Mm-hmm. But you can always get suckered in because it, it's so terrible. Did it? One, one of the insult to injury moments is uh, when it sucks and it was late. Like they say, eh, we think August of 2017. And then it yeah. shows up uh, December 2019 and it's a piece of shit. <laughs> it's too. it's yeah. still just a plastic. And, yeah. and along the way, they're giving you every excuse possible for why. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the, you feel like the, the John Lovitz's character for yeah. the, the liars. Yeah. <laughs> no, we're almost that's ready to go with it, but uh, <laughs> uh, the, the, the factory burned down in China. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's yeah, the ticket. Yeah, that's the ticket. You always get, like, also at the end of it, the, like, apologetic, like, oh, it's late, I'm sorry. How about a discount on a future one? It's like, no, no I, yeah. there's no way in the hell. Yeah. Get out of here. Uh, on the table here is uh, one of my first <laughs> Kickstarter things. Uh-huh. It's this mm. iPad stand. Oh, okay. And uh, it's been kick-ass. Yeah, it looks good. Yeah. Uh, and it's supposed... But what it doesn't do that it's supposed to do is fit... Um, for a few, few viewers, there's this thing that's holding an iPad that kind of just looks like a... I don't know, from a Z profile from the left, and it's kind of this thing that folds up. And it's supposed to fit the behind-the-seat-back tray table of an airline seat. That, oh, that's, that, yeah. that's its claim. That's, that's a good way I've learned from that. It's a good way when that person reclines to get hit on the head with your oh, own good. iPad <laughs> and nearly get a gash in your forehead. So. What's your first one, Richard? All right, so my first one, I've got two product choices and two celebrity choices. Oh. So I'll do one of the product ones first. This thing is called the Dragonfly Future Phone. Future Whoa. Phone spelled F future than F-O-N. There's yeah. also an umalot in Scar- there somewhere. Scarlett Johansson was in the film adaptation of that. It was, it was yeah, of... there's a little bit of whitewashing that yeah. happened with yeah. that film. Yeah. No, so on the surface, it, it's an idea that, especially when it, they first announced it in 2014, it was it sounded like it was too good to be true. It was a dual screen phablet laptop. It could also be used as a phone. It had the latest, most powerful processors. <laughs> phablet. And well, that's like a it's like a, a phone tablet. That's thing. something your aunt has. Like, oh, she's kind of got she's kind of fat, but she's kind of oh, she's, she's got a phablet. phablet. It's not like a, it's like a fupa, but it's a phablet. <laughs> so it had all the all the most powerful processors, and it could run both Windows and iOS. Really? Just for and all for seven ninety nine. Oh my god. <laughs> Guess what? It was too good to be true. Guess what? Uh, so this was something that was on Indiegogo. And I should say, as far as I can tell, is still on here, which, which will, will, will be pretty amazing once we get down to it. Wow. First, first launched in 2014. Um, the guy behind this, his name is Jeff Batio. <laughs> so <laughs> patio, but you replace the P with a B. The, the patio. That, that's just a, a name that I don't trust his to begin fir- with. His first invention was his own name. His own name. And so that, he wanted that, a name that sounded sort of like Jeff Bezos. Yeah, but just he couldn't, tech, couldn't get sued on. That sounds like a George Lucas creation of a bad guy name. His name is Darth Badio. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And this guy was a, is a bad guy. He's a total con artist. He'd been sued in 2001 because he had uh, promised investors that he would create a, comp, uh, a product from his company, Zintech Technologies. Again, another bad name. This all wow. sounds very suspicious. I mean, you know what this thing was? It was a laptop that had two detachable screens. <laughs> And guess what? Didn't work. Never, never came up with a prototype. Just took the investor's <laughs> money and ran. Wound up getting sued all over the place. He uh, lied. It was called the Voyager. He raised several million dollars and then wound up not actually being able to produce anything and got sued. Wound up taking you know loans from the company to take, so he could go on vacations and stuff oh, like wow. that. So then he comes back in about 2006 with something from Amana Systems. Or Armada Systems, my bad. Oh, oh, not the radar range no. manufacturer. Okay. No, it was a, it was a a a, a uh, 
washer dryer that had dual screens. Wow. No, just kidding. <laughs> no, but it was basically the, another thing that had patents that had dual screens. Except for this one, instead of being like side by side, it was literally like it would fold up like a billfold. <laughs> and you'd have like the, wow. the, the keyboard on the bottom and then two screens that were stacked one on top of the other. So not only was this never going to get made, it was like practically impossible. Like there's no way you could even see how this would possibly work. Another batio idea. <laughs> a lot of these, uh, a lot of these top uh, 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 inventions are trying to solve some sort of problem. What is yeah. the problem that people face with running two different? You said it ran like Mac and I mean, it's Android Macs and yeah, iOS and Android. I, why would you? Oh, need you that? said you, Windows, and I thought you said Windows. Either and iOS. it doesn't matter. Yeah, who cares? It's uh, like who needs to run that at the same time and like on your phone? Yeah, on your phone and like. Oh, well, it's a phablet though. Right. Never mind. Yeah, guys, it's I a forgot phablet. it was a phablet. <laughs> Please, <laughs> never mind. I take it all back. Yeah. So the whole idea was this was to be like a one. You'd have like one computer, and they'd be have like a really wide like keyboard, and then you'd have like two tablet sized screens that you could dock and you could use it as one screen but if you detached them you could use, use one of them as a tablet you could use another one as a phone and it was all just supposed to work independently of each other and it's you know and they first tried to raise money for it they only got about eighteen thousand dollars and they called it uh the if convertible by ideal future i'm so confused by whatever the product is yeah like, I think this is how they get you, mm-hmm. is they just keep throwing, like, a half a dozen names. Yeah. Oh, are you talking about the, um, the, the, fa- the Fabio Fablet? Um, it's also the If Convertible. And you're like, uh, I thought we were talking... We were talking about the, the If? The Dragon? The I thought it was the Dragon... It's not the Dragonfly? Mm, I don't, I'm so confused. I, I guess I'll give you money. Was there a p- convincing photo of it? On they the... had lots of great 3D sort of like like schematics oh, and yeah. layouts. I'm in. And uh, oh. like, you know, videos. They had concepts with lots of lots of photoshopping happening. Yeah. Um, and and the second time around, when they renamed it the Dragonfly Future Phone, uh, they wound up raising over s- more than seven hundred thousand dollars for this thing. Yeah. Um, you know, they got covered on like Gizmodo UK, BGR, Trusted Reviews. A lot of tech sites gave them like, wow, this thing could be the wave of the future. And it's like nobody looked into this guy's past because yeah. it's crowdfunding. This, this seems to be like a pattern with crowdfunding. It's like it doesn't matter who the track record doesn't matter. Yeah. It's just if you have a cool idea and you can sell it. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the Shark Tank post Shark Tank world because. It's all about the idea. It's not about having any sort of expertise or ability to actually execute on this. Yeah. It's just about who has the coolest idea and who can sell it. Well, do you think it has always been that way? Because, but now we are entering, your average Joe is, is entering in the world of the entrepreneur where we have not been before. Like, some of your attraction to shysters is these people in the past who've been able to sell people on a giant bridge from here to Mexico right. or something like that. You know, there's been fast, smooth talking shysters, hucksters and shysters before, but now we're in the business. I mean, the music man has always existed. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But they would have to go from town to town and like work like a, a griff that was like uh-huh. a personal thing here. It's like you can, you can grift and just sort of never have to have touch yeah. anybody yeah. to do it. Yeah. Which is which is is remarkable to me. So, it, like I said, as far as I can tell, I went on. If you go on Indiegogo and you search for this thing, it's still on there, and it still says, you know, get this perk and uh, that you can order it and all this stuff. So I don't know why that they've never shipped anything. The uh, public records have shown that uh, the business license has actually expired for the company. Oh. Um, all they have are renderings still, and the spec sheet apparently was just copy and pasted from the Galaxy S5. Oh, that's <laughs> which is the greatest, laziest thing ever. Some of that is stuff that you just it incenses you because it's it's really impacting people's desire to support legit developers. But then you yeah. got you got to admire the cojones. <laughs> it it takes guy. a lot of balls to just and he, the guy that good old Jeff Badio would call himself a a. Uh, Dynamic futurist. That's yeah. what he called himself. Because that sounds like something that's more than just inventor. Yeah. Like he's 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 like a you know a Steve Jobs like like yeah. you know genius level sort of thinking about what's the next level of computing gonna be when really he's just some huckster who's trying to like like rip people off. Yeah. Uh Michael, what do you got? Uh my second one is the Scarp Laser Razor. <laughs> <laughs> I love these things that sound like an improv sketch. 
<laughs> Hello, sir. What is that you have in your hand there? It's the Scarp Laser Razor. And the audience is like, what? That's, that's, the only, that's as good as he got? It's like a Mad Lib. It's a Mad Lib. What is it? Uh, it is a shaving device. It's a razor that uh, supposes, and it promotes the idea that it can shave your face via the power of lasers <laughs> just by, like, shaving right down your cheek and just... Voop. Wow. This thing raised $4 million. Oh, wow. On Kickstarter before they were kicked off because the proof of concept really didn't work. Oh, wow. Then they made their way over to Indiegogo and continued to raise an additional $500,000. Wow. And it just never really worked. It's this thing that hasn't gotten really much further past the like prototype design. Right. It's still out there. You can still like sign up and give these hucksters money. But like it cuts like one or two hairs at a time. <laughs> and that's about it. Like the proof of concept is so minute and so inefficient yeah. that it's just I guess Kickstarter has a policy now that if you if you're you don't have a provable design or you don't have a provable product, they're basically gonna give you the boot. Uh, what what is it that do you think inventions are like say an attractive person where there's certain things that catch our eye and convince us that there's something worthwhile about that person and we wouldn't we don't do that much more research past something that's very surface i don't know i think they kind of come into they kind of fall into a few different categories usually it's like it's like with the kitter box the, the litter box trying to solve a common issue like shaving really isn't an issue in in terms of like the scarp laser razor <laughs> <laughs> no one is like itching to shave their cells with a laser. <laughs> but I think people are intrigued by the idea of the future being like at their fingertips. Oh, yeah. Like that feels like something that would have been in Demolition Man. Like in the future, that's how they shave. They just uh, sort of go, last, this to shave. last yeah. night we watched uh, The Running Man. Oh, okay. That movie was made in like 86 or 87 and feels like it's set in 1989. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they made the littlest efforts to make it futuristic, even though it's set in 2017 and 2018. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. So we were looking around the desolation that yeah. is our apartment in America, and it was like, eh, it doesn't look like anything <laughs> like this movie. But um, it's weird when a imagine, imagining of the future is so, like, garbage. Yeah. But, like, any, any, you know, anything added, added lasers to it. And, you know, there's some, like, probably technology that works. There's, you know, laser removal is a thing. Yeah, laser hair removal, yeah. But, but, like, this product in itself just didn't quite have the working prototype to garner getting people to give them $4 million. Mm -hmm. And Kickstarter gave them the boot for it. And they're like, you can't... We have a policy, and they... Like, the owners of it or inventor of it or whatever kind of was like, yeah, we're not quite there yet, in spite of, like, the really cool video they have that shows. But... Uh, I think that there's also a, I think people invest in things that they didn't either know was a problem or is like, oh, that's, I didn't know that existed. I'll, you know, for like ecological issues or like, Mm -hmm. I don't know, uh, trying to help someone out, I think is always not a bad thing. I think that's, I think you, you pull certain either heartstrings or you pull at someone's imagination Mm -hmm. or you pull at your own particular difficulties in the world. Yeah. I think that's how you get people. It's it's the heart, it's the future, and it's the, oh, my God, I need a a better paper towel holder Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with lasers. With lasers. With lasers. All right, Richard, what do you got? So do you guys remember when Zach Braff was was a thing? Yeah. Remember back in the aughts? Yeah. When, when we had a more carefree lifestyle and we'd let some goober from Scrubs become like a successful auteur. Yeah. And he would let said uh, success get to his head mm-hmm. and then insist that he needed total creative control for his next movie. Yeah. Well, that's what happened to, to, to Monsieur Braff um, oh. for his follow up to Garden State. He decided he was going to uh, raise $3 million so he could get the movie made on his terms <laughs> oh, but his terms meaning he needed I, I don't know the shins needed more money to be able to write more songs or he needed to be able to fund more wistful uh, you know matching wallpaper and shirts I don't know what what he needed the money for um, you know and most of the time you would say well, you know good for you you want to make a money movie on your terms you want to get out yeah stick it to the studio stick it to the yeah. man bully for you 
But then when the same filmmaker has already made tens of millions of dollars by actually being part of the system from his, uh, you know, starring in a maybe slightly better but than mediocre but long-running sitcom, that can rub people the wrong way. Mm-hmm. So that's what happened with Zach Braff when he, in 2013, he decided to make a follow-up to Garden State called Wish I Was Here. And he went about trying to uh, do a Kickstarter fundraiser for $3 million. And people went, wait a second, your net worth is like $22 million. If you really want to make this movie on your own terms, yeah. why don't you just pay for it out of your own pocket? Yeah. And then it got worse after he raised the $3 million. He then went back and picked up additional financing, uh, essentially for the international release, Be, uh, above and beyond the $3 million he said he needed to get the money made. And people sort of went, whoa, whoa, what the hell? You said you, this is going to cost you $3 million, and you were trying to do it outside the studio system, and now you've got outside fun- funding? What's mm-hmm. going on? And as much as it pains me to, to say this, I think Zach Braff was kind of right. Because... He did get to make the movie on his own terms. You know, he made the movie. After the movie was made, he then went and got additional funding. Or he, As the movie was being made, he was able to sign this deal to get additional funding so they could release it internationally. It really had nothing to do with how the movie was shot, what the uh, uh-huh. scenes were, anything like that. And by all accounts, it's a pretty mediocre movie. So maybe he needed... The problem is maybe he needed the studio interference. Like, so many times... I. I, I think there are times when people want to be auteurs mm-hmm. who just aren't cut out for that. Yeah. And maybe having a producer or someone, an outside voice who can sit there and say, well, maybe you need to dial down on this. Maybe this is a tad bit schmaltzy or maybe you're kind of leaning into this a little too heavy. And he had one successful movie. And then he started to think that he could do this on his own. And I think that's ultimately... More than anything to do with the fact that, hey, he had a lot of money and he decided to go, you know, raise this Kickstarter money. Because, look, people knew what they were getting into when they, when they, when they agreed to, to fund this. I think to some extent with Kickstarter funding, you have to be willing to just say, I'm giving $50 because I believe in this project. And he, you know, everything that he promised, you know, whether it was, you know, giving you a phone call or you know, having your name in the credits or whatever it happened to be. He did all of those things. Um, but I think the real lesson about this is the fact that he fought and fought and fought and did all this work and kind of damaged his own reputation to some extent so he could have creative control of this movie. <laughs> then the movie kind of sucked. Oh, yeah. Right? And yeah. Th- maybe that's the lesson a little bit here with, with some yeah. of these movies that get kickstart funded. Yeah. Maybe you need somebody to come in as maybe there's a, maybe producers are there for a reason. Yeah. Maybe they're not just there just to screw you over mm-hmm. and, and try to break your artistic vision, man. Yeah. Maybe they're actually there sometimes to help you. Yeah. I do find that fascinating the the entertainment industry and the film industry and how it is exists in relationship to the creative process. And there's an industry called development, uh, and people who work in that industry they sit on the bench their entire life. They play maybe one game in their entire career. They maybe get a movie right. made. And their job is, for the most part, to take meetings and to develop things. Not to make movies, right. to develop things. To grab a script that somebody else had before them, that somebody else will have after them. And so if I'm Zach Braff or somebody like that, I get frustrated probably by those people. Uh, but then how do you distinguish those people ultimately from the people who are going to give you good feedback uh, to like an M. Night Shyamalan who thinks it's a good movie about an apartment complex with some monster in the pool or, or something like that. Be- right. Because he didn't listen to, or a guy like George Lucas, he didn't live, listen to his detractors and he had success before. And there's nobody there who to tell him no. Yeah, there's nobody can tell him no. He's eliminated the people who are going to give him that kind of feedback. But I would say you're always ultimately going to collaborate with, and in this case, in the marketplace, you're going to collaborate with another person and they're going to give you feedback the buyer. They're not going to right. buy your product. <laughs> yeah, That's the and, worst feedback. That's the worst time to get that feedback. And and, and, and the movie bombed. Yeah. And, and I haven't seen him doing any movies. He's, uh, he's got an ABC sitcom now. So, yeah, yeah, so he's kind of like crawled back into the system. Yeah. And I think it's just part of it was like Garden State was presented as this success of indie filmmaking. And then going out there and 
saying, I'm going to kickstart this next project so I don't have to have any outside interference. Yeah. It felt like a betrayal of what you would consider to be the indie aesthetic. And I don't yeah. think it actually was. I just think the fact that the movie... If it had been a really good movie, we're probably not having this conversation about this being a Kickstarter failure. Yeah. But the fact that the movie bombed, it's easy to go back and say, oh, wow, man, he raised $3 million mm -hmm. for this. Mm -hmm. uh, that is fascinating. Yeah, success does rewrite the uh, history <laughs> in favor. Right. But I could, I, what I think Kickstarter does a good job of is discovering your market. And if you set it a low threshold for success, if he said, I wanted to make $100,000, now he's got this cool awareness of his fan base and... Uh, now he can build upon that. But when you set this very high threshold for success, you walk away with jack shit because you don't really know who your fan base is you didn't, or you know that they resent you. So, yeah, I think you have to ask for a little bit and then see it as the first level of marketing for, for this future product, like the Scarp Laser Razor. So you're saying this was the Scarp Laser Razor This is the Scarp of, of film, yeah. Yeah, basically. Yeah. So we are going to halftime, and uh, we are going to be back, but not... Uh, until after you listen to this promotion for a fun podcast that we support wholeheartedly. Hey, my name's Paul, and I'm not an animal expert. I'm Donna, and I'm not an animal expert either. And together we do a podcast about animals called Varmints. Every week we pick an animal, do a bunch of research on it, and bring you some interesting facts about that animal. But we don't stop there. We talk about that animal in movies, TV, and other pop culture. And we talk about whether or not that animal would make a tasty dish, and how intelligent we think it is on the scale of 1 to 10. It's exactly like one of those fancy PBS nature documentaries. Except with more poo jokes! New episodes go live every Thursday wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Or you can visit us at blazingcariboustudios.com. <laughs> Varmints! Varmints! <laughs> <laughs> All right. We are back, and we have something to give you. We're not going to ask you for a minimum contribution where it's not a crowdfunding or crowdsourcing. We are going to ask, uh, we're going to give you something, and that is a free trial to audible.com. For you, the listeners of Mount Rushmore Podcast, they're offering over at Audible a free audiobook download with a free 30 day trial to give you the opportunity to check out what they got. You could read Kickstarter Launch Formula. Or you could listen to Kickstarter Launch Formula, the crowdfunding handbook for startups, filmmakers, and independent creators by Salvador Brigman. With Audible, you can get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial by going to audibletrial.com slash Rushmore. They got 180,000 titles and more to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. To download your free audiobook today... God, what if you just had an MP3 player? There was no none of the branding? You just right. got it? Like, it just what says is, MP3? It just says MP3 player. Would you even know how to do it? Yeah, that's so strange. Okay, so... Sorry, we're going to go off on a quick tangent. Yeah. So whenever I set up these events for, that we record... Hey, listener audience, this is a behind the scenes. I create like a, a different event, name it something stupid. Yeah. Uh, oh, maybe, yeah. Maybe like it's called like Smogcast and I invite Jeff and Richard. And yeah. Just so we have it on the calendar and we talk about the topics and blah, blah, blah. This week's was called Zoomcast. Yes. Imagining a world in which the pod... The, the iPod... Uh, was it the main source of listening yeah, to like sh streaming content or like kind of mm -hmm. these radio shows that yeah. we do? Like we, there is a parallel world where the the iPod was taken over at some point by the Zune. Yes, and we are all listening to Zune casts. Hey, right hit me now. up on my Zune phone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but like, it's so funny that like you just put yeah. that up. And, like I, I and like the what your response just now is just like, oh yeah, I wasn't even thinking of that at all. No, just this generic MP3 player. Yeah. So go mm. there. Uh, for your Zoom yeah, and get a thing. audibletrial.com Rushmore your free audiobook uh, do us a solid uh, this mm. is this is where he's talking you this is, <laughs> all these free goodies that come with uh, yeah. downloading our podcast yeah. hey if you do, if you uh, listen to our podcast you'll get all this for <laughs> stuff for free too this is all the free stuff that you get just for uh, crowdfunding um, crowd supporting our podcast by going to iTunes and rating and reviewing our podcast so other people can uh, understand what you think of it and maybe discover it. Uh, we're going to give you free back episodes of our podcast. Yeah, free. Yeah, so you don't have to uh, get at your credit card or anything like that. So go to Stitcher or iTunes and go check out 
past issues, episodes of our podcast. We'd also like to invite you to our social handles on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and join in the dialogue. Give us your suggestions as to shows you'd love to see us uh, tackle and uh, maybe aspects of shows that you think we made a mistake on in previous uh, episodes. We'd love that. And now we are back. And Michael, what is your third? Uh, I'm going to stay in the world of movies, Richard, and actually mention okay. something that you brought up at the onset. Veronica Mars, the film. Okay. This was a movie that brought in $5.7 million in Kickstarter funds. Within the first, like, 12 hours, well, got a million dollars. Then, uh, within a very short time frame, jumped up to $2 million. Wow. This was for a canceled TV show that only had 64 episodes yeah. that I'm guessing a small portion of fans really wanted to see how it ended, mm-hmm. but was canceled because no one really watched the show. Hmm. I find that amazing that a small group of people can get something put out there and then they didn't go see the movie. This movie <laughs> brought in $3.5 million worth of box office on yeah. a $6.5 million budget. Wow. Wow. And that's kind of a failure. Mm -hmm. It might not be a failure to the people that wanted to see this very specific thing happen. Yeah. I don't know whether it was good or not. I've never seen the TV show. I assume it was fine. 64 episodes fine. I guess the fans of the show never got, like, the resolution to Veronica Mars that they needed to have. Hmm. I have no idea what the show is about. She's a detective or something. Who cares? It doesn't matter. It's aliens. Yeah. It's what? It's what? Uh, It's basically, like, encyclopedia. Is she from Mars? No, no, it's like Encyclopedia Brown, but grown up. <laughs> like, like in high school. I think she uh, has a sister who has the power to make ice come out of her hands. Okay, cool. I okay, want to see okay. that. I want to see that. Okay. Me. But I think what is interesting is when it fulfills a very specific niche, but overall, kind of, it lost money. It lost yeah. two and a half, three million dollars to the people, you know, the, the people that invest in these things, they don't necessarily invest... Um, because they're getting money back on the end. I think that's where there's some difference in it. Mm. You know, I'm looking at their different tiers and rewards that they get. You know, at a dollar, you're pledging for it. At $10, you get a PDF of the shooting script. $25, you get a limited edition Veronica Mars, the movie t-shirt. $35, this is the most interesting one. You will see a digital version of the movie within a few days of the movie's theatrical debut, plus all oh. the other stuff. So they kind of shot themselves in the foot, giving out the copy of the thing oh. that now the people that, in theory, wanted to see this. They didn't really want to see it in the, main, yeah. in the theater. Yeah. They wanted to own a copy of it. Okay. They wanted this resolution. I don't know. That's kind of yeah. weird. Well, do you think they, like it, what they I, wanted to do was support Veronica Mars? Like, I have those... I guess like, so. That's a fictional character that doesn't exist. Well, I, I, don't, want to, I don't want to see my friend's improv group but I do want to support my friend. Okay. So I, maybe it was something like that. Like, I believe in Kristen Bell and the creators and that I like, that I'm going to I like the show, but I don't like it enough to see the movie. Yeah. Uh, That's, y- I, I, or I don't, yeah. Uh, it's, something, it's something, there's something that and like, is get, unsettling about it, where it's just like, you think that they would take 10 of their friends to go see yeah. this thing to make this, to prove their point. It's like the proof of concept, but yeah. they wanted to pay $35 to see this 90-minute yeah. version of the show that and then they're out of there and they got the t-shirt that is strange i do wonder if it if it even shows the almost like the the campaign was part of people's enjoyment of it hmm. and they felt like well over uh, good it succeeded and that's all i cared about there is something interesting that happens when you see a movie that you like let's say i saw a new star wars or the avengers is coming out and it's already out or something i don't yeah. know and that breaks box office records. And one, you wanted to see the movie. Two, you liked it. And three, there's like that weird part of you're like, yeah, I helped get them there. Yeah. It, you, yeah. They don't actually care. I mean, they care in that they're making money off of you, but it's not like, it's a weird personal, like, it's like being one of the people that, like, you discovered a band before they got big. You're like, I was part, I was part of that thing. Yeah. I think that there's a lot of this that goes into these Kickstarters or Indiegogos or films where you're just like, I was a kind of real life, but kind of fictional producer on this movie. I helped get it over the finish line. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. Maybe I'm thinking, it's possible that I'm like thinking too much of it in terms of like traditional Hollywood. Oh yeah. 
box office yeah. to whatever. But like, those are real numbers. Those are uh-huh. people didn't go see this movie. Yeah. Oh, time portal. Time portal. Greetings. It is I, young 15 year old Benjamin Franklin. Hey, How man. are you? What up, Benny? Fair met by daylight, young squires. I am. I, I expected 15 year old Benjamin Franklin to talk cooler than that. I'm an apprentice. Well, call, I think. Call, call us dude. Cooler. Dude. Why, these are wonderful. There we go. Idiomatic expressions here in this new world. I, I, uh, I'm also, in addition to being a skilled apprentice printer, somewhat of an inventor myself. And there are many inventions I would like to invent. I've got some copyrights for something, some drawings for Franklin Stove. I've got some drawings for batteries that run off this thing called electricity. Do you guys think those are interesting? Mm. You're, you're, yeah, you, yeah, you're, yeah, okay, I, mean, I, don't yeah, yeah, I don't understand them, but well, you, you, I don't you, understand the, how they work. The here stuff it, from the sky? Are we, yes. That's dangerous. That shit fries. Well, wait till mm. you hear about this other shit I've been working on. Mm-hmm. A snuff hat. Oh, oh, you I'm know, interested. I've been working on this thing where... You could put two bottles of wine in a hat and sit that on your head, and there's a <laughs> tube that comes down into your mouth. I could see that would be fun watching a sporting event or a hanging or something like that. But, <laughs> you know, I'm going to shelve the, the batteries and the, and the lightning and the Franklin stove and bifocals and inventing the post office and inventing the library and working on the first draft of the constitution and the uh, the best thing about richard the best thing about in, uh, investing in 250 year old uh technology mm-hmm. we can give him like five bucks and he thinks that's well oh that's true <laughs> it's just now we're talking sweet coin <laughs> five dollars i got i got like a tenner in my pocket why don't we just ten dollars and then He's gonna freak out when he sees his oh. bill, by the way. <laughs> when he's on when he sees that he's on the money that we're giving him. What are you speaking over there in <laughs> hushed tones? Oh nothing, nothing, nothing. Okay. Well, you know, forget about all those cool other inventions. What do you think of my kick ass snuff hat idea? Love it. Okay, I shall place it in front of all those other inventions. In fact, I'll never do those other inventions. Whoa, well, well. Due to your good advice, mm. future citizens. Mm. I, we, we need we need electricity though, or else the podcast doesn't work and then you never show up. Oh, I can't breathe your future air. So many diseases. I'm dying. Oh. Hey guys, what's up? Hey, hey where, where'd you go? Did you go step out to get a fresco or something? Yeah, I had to get a fresco from the fridge. The yummy taste of fresca is my favorite. Uh, who drinks tab anymore? Not me. Amateurs. <laughs> that's who does. I like that the Jeff from 1983 came back as well. I was <laughs> <laughs> stuck in the time stream a little bit. Shake it, get your head. Get oh, your yeah. head. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Richard, what's your third choice? Uh, my third choice, we'll go back to the product here. And this one is the coolest cooler. <laughs> so, well, certainly there, there must be a cooler. Cooler than this cooler. It's the coolest cooler. Well, then I am, I am wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Not so, cool, Michael. Uncool, very uncool. <laughs> it, it's a cooler that has, you'll, you'll start to see this pattern happen a lot. It's that you take one thing that's functional. Yeah. And then you add 80 other functions to it. Oh, yeah. And suddenly, now, now you got something you want to invest in. So it's a cooler. It's got a Bluetooth speaker. Oh, shit, yeah. A USB charger, a cutting board, and a blender. What? How, what? For $187. That's wow. $185. So where do you sign up? The Kickstarter, of course. Just don't really ever expect to see the damn no. thing. No. Finally, a cooler that's I think actually I saw cool. This. I think I saw this. Is it like... The design of it's pretty smooth. Too, yeah, right? it yeah. looks great. It's a real product. This is not like the dragonfly fab fabulate yeah. fable thing. This is like a real thing. Um, but two years after this thing launched, um, probably about a third of the backers have actually received their coolers. Oh, so about twenty thousand people, leaving about thirty six thousand people who have paid for it, still waiting for it. Wow, haven't got it. Wow. Um, and th- it starts to fall into that category, I think, like you, the, you started talking about with the, uh, the cat litter box. Yeah. Where it's just people who have a great idea but have no idea how to actually, how business works and how manufacturing works. And like 
they don't understand these potential obstacles. They don't have contingency plans. So yeah. if like one thing breaks in this chain, mm-hmm. it just throws everything off. Hey, yeah. it's got double wide rubberized wheels. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> You know what this reminds me of? This is like in Gremlins. The father is an inventor, and he invents the bathroom buddy. This is the bathroom buddy, but for coolers. You have way too many things like sticking out of here and unfolding out of here, Uh and you're just like, am I ever going to use a blender at a beach? I don't need a blended margarita that much. Do you? How how does that Mm. the blender work? I imagine it's kind of like... I don't know. I, don't I didn't get one. I didn't order oh, one. Oh, it sits on the top. <laughs> oh, I is see. that what it is? I yeah. Have, like, actually, I have it in front of me. Yeah, and it kind of like just sits there on the top. So yeah. you've got a cutting board you can kind of, I think, pull out. I mean, the concept is great. The problem is you can't actually get it. Mm-hmm. Um, about a year after they launched it, people started getting really upset. Like, hey, where's this damn thing? And they said, hey, we're going to ship it all out by November. This is in August. So everyone will start getting them in November. Just understand it's, it's more difficult to ship, ship a cooler than it is to mail a letter. That was their... Uh, and th- that kind of condescending attitude doesn't exactly help mm-hmm. you know, calm the nerves yeah. of angry investors. It's not our problem. It's your problem. Then once November came around, they started putting posts on the uh, four backers only wall that was like protected. Mm. And posters start going up like, factory strike update. <laughs> oh wow! So they would just keep. It was it was the John Lovitz thing. They would just keep piling up these delays, and yeah. anytime something would happen, they wouldn't have a contingency plan for it. Or do you know Freon addiction runs rampant in China? <laughs> <laughs> They're completely out of Freon. Freon. In China. Freon. Um, okay, th- so uh, looking at this thing, yeah, this must weigh a ton. It can't be light. Because it's got a little bit of everything on it. It's got there. everything included on it. It's got some sort of battery component that you have to either recharge. I assume you have to recharge it constantly. Its lifespan must be so limited. Yeah. Plus, once you fill it with like ice and like <laughs> beers and stuff, like you want a cheap plastic thing to carry ice and beers. Yeah. You don't need it to like, like this thing must, you have to be the strong, you have to be the strongest, stronger yeah. to carry the coolest cooler. Well, you. And also, I mean, this thing, it has to run like it's on its own, like, like go-kart engine or something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I can't hear you. I got the coolest cooler going. <laughs> so they, so yeah. the next step that they did is after the, after the, uh, after the, the deadline passed, they told people, well, we're going to start selling it on Amazon now. Oh, yeah. But we have to do this to keep the lights on. Yeah. And we're going to sell it for $400 on Amazon. But you guys still are going to get the price of $185. You oh locked God, in yeah. as soon as we're able to get enough. Mm-hmm. As soon as we're able to sell enough on Amazon that we can then go ahead yeah. and make the rest that we need to order for you guys. Mm-hmm. Then about six months later, uh, they had an update that said, hey, if you want to get your coolest cooler in the next three months, uh, we can get to you in the next three months. It's going to be an extra 100 bucks. Oh, God. Or you can wait till after the three months, and we'll probably get it to you. Yeah. Coolest cooler seems like... The guy that my wife dated in college, right? Who was like he rode a motorcycle, he played like guitar, pretty flashy kind of guy, good dresser, mm-hmm. he probably had a leather jacket, and then I'm just like a Coleman cooler, like reliable, affordable, like a, you can you can clean me out with a hose, like a garden hose right. and some some Clorox or something like that. You don't do anything fancy. No, I don't do You're nothing reliable. fancy. Your handle doesn't break. I've never yeah. seen your handle break. You never once. seen my handle break. You could use me as a cutting board, like clean a fish. Yeah, got a fish if you needed to. Yeah, you could probably sit sit on me next to the fire, you know, the fire, and like strum your guitar or something like that. Yeah, I, I, I have. Look, I, I don't think that, again. I don't think this is the same as the first product I talked about, the dragonfly mm. fabu- fabulous thing. It, it feels like this is a guy who who got in way over his head. It feels mm. like something that a character from The Office would come up with. <laughs> yeah. A, a, as like the reason that he's going to quit the company. Like like Michael Scott came up with this. And this is what he de- why he decided to leave uh, the, the paper business. Yeah. And then the thing fell apart. And then six months later, he has to try and figure out how to, yeah. <laughs> how to fix it. It's not a good idea, like my DVD rewinder. <laughs> so I, I, I couldn't find any of like you know actual like product information on the coolest cooler website just now like how much it weighs I had to go to Amazon yeah. since you mentioned it a uh-huh. uh, little bit of like time space manipulation going oh. here uh, item weight 39 pounds okay that's a really heavy cooler wow, shipping yeah. weight 
38.8 pounds. What? What, what happened? How does it well, go when it's possible? Well, when it's in the air, it's not as close to <laughs> the Earth, so gravity is less, so he loses about 2 You know two what happens? Pounds. The propeller blades on the... On the Oh. And the thing are spinning, so it's lifting up oh, slightly. It's lifting it. oh, so right. you just you just turn it to lift, and it's just like slightly hovering. It's, it's the blender when you turn it, the blender on; the whole thing goes. You win again, coolest cooler. <laughs> you win again. You win again. Uh, Michael, uh, what's your final one? Uh, once I knew Richard opened this up to something a little bit bigger than uh, Kickstarter or Indiegogo uh, to crowdfunding. Mm-hmm. The worst crowdfunding thing that was ever in the history of man. The fire Festival. The U.S. government's taxes. Oh. Wow. Our government is run by the people giving them money to do things for them. Yeah. The things that our government does for us mm-hmm. is just fucked up yeah. beyond repair. Yeah. And we're $21 trillion in debt to ourselves. To ourselves. And the government. We have paid each person. Not only do you currently fund wars, yeah, uh, lots of uh, weapons of that murder people, yeah, uh, also a lot of good things like um, schools and healthcare, right, and things we actually need to have a functioning society. Not yeah. everything is bad about, about yeah. giving money to the government. Each person currently owes oh sixty four thousand dollars to the government, uh, wow. in in terms of like ever coming square with it, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, what a complete sham that they have what the wool that they have pulled over our eyes uh this is is this where this podcast turns into like some sort of like like libertarian like a uh, rant the cabin that i have in the woods <laughs> <laughs> is the one thing that is not <laughs> not I, paid I, for I, by taxes I, are you homeschooling I, your no, children i am not a libertarian weirdo i um I just think that, like, it's amazing how badly <laughs> the money that we all spend. Like, we just got through tax season, and somehow we got a little bit of money back. We're going to... I don't know how that works yeah. exactly. I don't know how I've, they've taken more money out than they should have. Or oh, yeah. yeah. It's not that you're getting it back. You give it's it. just that they... It's not they're, they're not giving you money. Right. They're just refunding you for the extra that you paid through the year. I don't know how... I, like, it feels like it's all been set up by shysters. Yeah, and it feels like the people that sometimes are in charge that we've elected to be like, you know, uh, representing us are just in cahoots with the rest of the other shysters. Yeah, and they're all just selling us like these. There's like a tier system and a reward system, and some people are getting like some people have paid a thousand dollars and are getting like great stuff back. Yeah, and there are people that are like paid five dollars and are getting nothing. Yeah, and it just sounds like you're talking about white people versus everybody else. Or there's like it feels like maybe that. This is like a mob sort of setup. Like yeah. there's some mob accountancy. There's like two sets of books. Do you think like there's oh, like, yeah. like there's one set of tax books for the rich people and another set for everybody else? That is the best thing about uh, the tax people that we take our taxes to to do. Uh, uh-huh. He just has posters up about how the tax man got Capone, and he has <laughs> oh, yeah. all like these wanted <laughs> posters of like Capone and like the whole th- like it's just like the tax man got. Yeah, him. I got a <laughs> tax man. <laughs> Dude, but there's is that, that song is that the song that plays constantly <laughs> yeah. in a loop? But Thanks, there, man. there is just something truly weird and messed up about yeah. like just the national debt and just the state that we're in. That mm-hmm. is, we're con- like it feels like the they're just going to be like, okay, I guess we owe money to people, yeah, and we're going to take your money and then fund whatever. Yeah. And, and if the American dream is the product that was offered, the sourcing that we've the money that we've put in yeah. <laughs> we've yet to, it's yet to arrive yeah. we keep getting the shipping delay update all right that's so what would you call that just in general what what, what is that the name of that i don't know the the, the us tax system us tax system got is, it okay. is it's baloney okay baloney Right down Indeed. below me. I don't, think, I don't think that they're asking us to crowdfund that that's not that's not an ask that's a requirement though well <laughs> it's even it's double baloney if we're required to. to my, my landscaper, he's not doing it. <laughs> he's not doing it. <laughs> I don't know what he's getting for it, but he's not doing it. Uh, Richard, what's your final? So oh. speaking about speaking of uh, uh, off kilt off kilter rants about the U.S. government Please and taxes let and everything it be about else. Baloney. Adam Carolla, uh, your buddy Ace Ace Man here. Yeah. Hey. Um, I'm okay. just a simple carpenter with a, <laughs> with a, a third grade education. Yeah, <laughs> he's, he's here. He's literally here, yeah. Michael. Um, 
decided to uh, crowdsource a movie that he was making called No Safe Spaces. Oh, I've seen this. Garbage. With his buddy, Dennis Prager of he's, Prager University, right wing uh, radio clown. Um, and I came across the trailer for this, and I think Jeff has it set up so we could listen to it. And Jeff, I'll have you stop it per- periodically so okay. I, can, I can pop in here. Okay, I'm pulling it up. The University of Tomorrow is here. A place of discovery, tolerance, and acceptance. We prepare our students for tomorrow's workforce by helping them discover their true gender, sexuality, and racial identity. We judge Stop. people. So this is basically, it starts off with this like fake ad for this uh, super liberal accepting college. And this whole thing is supposed to be like this big joke about how, mm. how liberal colleges are just, you know, have they run amok? Are they baloney? They may be baloney. Mm. Please, uh. please continue for more hilarity. Based on racial origin and history of oppression. We call it the progressive stack. I'm black. I'm Hispanic. I'm Asian. I'm a student at Utopia University. See, that's university wacky. Was- See, that's wacky because the girl who said she was black was actually white. Mm-hmm. The one who said she was Asian was actually black. Yeah. Because, you know, accepting people for who they are and what they, cl- you know, what they claim in their own yeah. racial background, that, that would be terrible if we actually did that. Yeah. Yeah. Go on. It's so I could be me. Unless I don't want to be me, then I can just be somebody else. You can pee next to me. Our campus is inclusive. and recognizes Yes, let's me. not be... Hispanic. By the way, l- yes, let's not be inclusive of transgender people. Yeah. That would be terrible yeah. if we did that. I'm Asian. I'm a student at Utopia University. This university was created so I could be me. Unless I don't want to be me, then I can just be somebody else. You can pee next to me. Our campus is inclusive Mighty. and recognizes the needs of all students. Except the Jews. Our commitment what? to diversity. Whoa. Like, what is that? where does that come from? Yeah. Am I miss? Someone help me out here. Is hmm. there, are, 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 are Jews somehow getting the shorted end of the stick? Hmm. I don't understand this. Keep going. Hmm. It means that nobody graduates until they think just the right way. At Utopia University, there are no violent words to hurt me. I will punch you if you're a fascist. I'm going to be the next Che Guevara. We speak out against privilege. We've We've checked checked our our privilege. privilege. Welcome to Utopia U. A wonderful place to learn that everything your parents taught you is wrong. It's all here at Utopia U, man. It's not based in reality. It's based on your reality. Wait, hold on a second. That campus doesn't really exist, does it? That doesn't even look like parody to me. You could run but that what if after the Lemon show on yeah. CNN, <laughs> and it would just play like a commercial. As a matter of fact, I don't know. What... Like, what is going on? Like, yeah. Like, like we could play this for the rest of the thing, and I don't really want to. But he, he starts like going off about how like, yeah, you remember when college campuses used to be places where there was free speech? Now you got these kids that are out here, and it's like, wait, you don't understand what free speech is, do you? The dopest thing was when uh, they, they had punching fascists as a negative. Yeah. Uh, are you kidding me? Yeah. And the whole, and he starts just, he kind of starts ranting about like, you know, I don't know why we focus on skin color or gender or sexual proclivity. What does that have to do with anything? Mm-hmm. Well, the fact that people are discriminated against based on all of those things, maybe that's why we should be talking about it. And it's just like every bad, you know what it is? I, it's even worse than somebody who's a, a raving, who comes off like a raving right wing nut, like Dennis Prager is, who's the, the guy he's doing this movie with. Mm-hmm. He tries to claim to be like, well, I'm not a Republican, I'm not a Democrat, I'm just a common sense person, mm-hmm. and it's only common sense that we shouldn't be we shouldn't be having these discussions about race because we should all be colorblind. And it's like, no, you're just trying to normalize racism. Right. Yeah, that's what you're trying to do. Yeah. Um, so the whole point of this Kickstarter is so that he and Dennis Prager can fund this movie where he's going to go, they're going to, I think, go around to different colleges and basically be dicks, be dicks, basically. Mm-hmm. And again, this, this, this is like the Zach Braff thing, but like to the nth worst degree, mm-hmm. Adam Carolla is sitting on uh, like, I don't know how much money he makes. Yeah. A shit ton. He makes more money on his podcast in one week than I'll ever see in like. 10 years. Yeah. You know, he does not need the crowdfunding to be able to go do this. Yeah. So the fact that, I mean, as, as my wife Sarah pointed out, he's kind of turned into Dennis Miller. Hmm. There was a point in time when he was just sort of like this, 
sort of goofy. Him and Jimmy Kimmel would go do their goofy kind of like man show shit. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't very political. It was just kind of like bro humor. Yeah. And it's like at some point, Jimmy Kimmel sort of matured and grew up and kind of grew out of that. And Adam Carolla just sort of like stayed in that lane and then just started drifting yeah. into this opposite direction. Mm-hmm. And so now he's this like, he dresses everything up in this like veneer of like, you know, I'm just like you said, I'm just a, a carpenter with a yeah. third grade education. But I'm I just a common see- man for work who works for his money. And, and whenever he's, whenever he, he's talking about intellectualism, he, he talks about his, I just, I'm barely literate. I have ADD. Or I, I almost, uh, um, I, all I have is a high school education. He doesn't also say, I, al- I also took improv classes at UCB. I've lived with liberal people in LA for my, <laughs> my entire, entire life. life. Yeah. I think he has this dog whistle like Alex Jones or, or Hannity yes. that he's trying to bait uh, these conservative people into a topic that they can, um, that they can all agree with, which, which is young people are scary and life isn't is uh, how it was when I was 20 years old and white America existed. So, yeah, it, yeah, it's, it's kind of nice to be a white guy in America. Yeah. Isn't it, Adam Carolla? Yeah, yeah. So I, so I just, I bring this one up just because it, Adam Carolla incenses me and there goes our chance of ever having him or Dave Damashek on the show, I suppose. Yeah. But I think we can live without yeah. that. I, Who I, cares? I just, I, he really, it, it, the, the fact that... There's definitely like, I used to listen to a show and like, like when it was on a, a podcast, and there was definitely at some point a turn, and I don't know what the turn was. It feels, it feels like something, like there was a sliding. Like, you know when someone gets slighted in a certain way, and then their entire life turns oh, yeah. to that thing? <laughs> it feels like something happened where he felt like extremely disrespected, or maybe it was when he, his radio show dropped and he was just doing the podcasts. And then he turned to doing stand-up again. Mm-hmm. And then maybe it was when he was doing stand-up and he's a bit more crass or he's a bit more... Or he's doing podcasts on the road. And maybe, right. maybe like some of his jokes weren't falling as funny as he thought it was when he wasn't getting any... Like, like his feedback wasn't what he thought. Yeah. I, I have no idea. I'm just projecting. Sure. And then maybe it was like, you know, a lot of his stand-up, you know, they'd play... I know with like the, the man, not with the man show, but with like uh, Love Line, you know, they used to play like colleges. Right. And maybe he got enough feedback where he determined that, oh, my jokes weren't falling or my, my stuff wasn't hitting the way I thought it would. So it's their fault. Well, I have. Yeah. And it's these places that aren't funny and these places that are holding me back and these places that are now, you know, well, I can, I, loony I, bins I or can, whatever. I can, I'll, even, I'll even add on that a little bit. I think what happened was here's my theory. You know, yeah, on Loveline, they would go do the college, college comedy tours things, you know, back in, what year was that, 2000, 97? The, ni- the, ni- late, the late 90s through early 2000s, yeah, yeah. And stuff that was considered to be perfectly fine to make jokes about mm. and that was perfectly acceptable back then doesn't, would, wasn't flying when he was going back up and doing stand-up and probably doing comedy tours mm-hmm. on, back at college campuses doing his stand-up or whatever yeah. four or five, you know, even a few years ago. Suddenly, the stuff that used to be used to be okay isn't okay, and so suddenly that's a problem because it's not working for him. Mm. But to your point, but it's not that it's it's just that times change, people evolve, and if, yeah. and if you're not able to evolve, you wind up becoming sort of this bitter. Yeah, there's always been like an like an edge of like well, not an edge, but like a blunt hammer of cynicism and things being fucked up on his show and things not working right or whatever, and then I think cut that with just kind of like a broad smear of general racism towards everyone, yeah. regardless of color, you know, and had a dash of everything else. And it's just like, you can see how it like just changes a person. It just becomes, it becomes unlistenable. Right. And like, I remember when I was listening to his podcast and even past when I probably should have, like, I remember something he said was like, oh, you know, and one of our friends on the show, one of the friends of the show, like Milo Yiannopoulos, and I was like, oh, I don't need to listen to this anymore. Mm-hmm. It was like immediately I deleted right. it, immediately removed it from the podcast feed. And it was like, this is like creep. Like, uh, uh, who, are these pe- like, who are these people that feel like they're actually uh, persecuted that aren't? Yeah. And that's uh, what it is. It's just like, you're, and I don't know. Uh, he, it feels gross to talk about. And, and the, thing I, the thing I'll end on is this. is not only can you f- crowdsource his new movie, 
You could also pay like a hundred bucks or whatever to do an online masterclass with him, where he'll teach you how to oh, yeah. start your own successful podcast. Yeah, which of course I don't think really quite works when step one is have a very successful radio show with million and TV show with yeah. millions of fans that you can leverage. Yeah. Fuck off. Fuck off. <laughs> All right, guys. Um, cool topic. Uh, I would invite our listeners to send in your crazy uh, Kickstarter fails or Indiegogo campaign fails or crowdsourcing uh, snafus. And check out her Patreon. We don't have a Patreon. Yeah, we Do don't have check it off. We don't. Don't, don't no. check that out. Uh, this week's going to get split down the middle. Uh, two points going to uh, Richard for Dragonfly <laughs> Future Phone, which is yeah. the Kanye West Can I get album, one? too. I think. I'm going to get one. <laughs> yeah. Get two. Get two. And... Um, I'm going to go with uh, The Coolest Cooler, just because it is the tale of... I think, you know, entrepreneurism is part of the core of the American identity, but then also fucking up grandly is part of the American identity, too. <laughs> I appreciate the fact that the fuck-up seems to be that he was too successful and couldn't make all of them. Yeah, supply chain. Um, and then, Michael, going to you for um, Litterbox. <laughs> and I thought that was a cool observation of the... The relationship that fans had with Veronica Mars that didn't um, actually... They wanted to support her, but they didn't want to support her all the way. Mm. So, yeah. So, that two and two. And appreciate you, the listener, listening. I know Richard and Michael do, too. Uh, this has been the Matt Rushmore Podcast. I, as per usual, am Jeff. I'm Richard. I'm Michael. 